There we go. All right. So welcome everybody to our very first uh, seminar for our series on uh, spotlighting the standards. My name is Linda Burrows and I am the K-12 Social Studies and World and Native Languages Specialist here at the Department of Education. I will let Maria introduce herself. Hello everybody, nice to see all of you in class today. And I am the kindergarten through sixth grade social studies and science content specialist for Mesa Public Schools. So nice to see everybody in class today. Fantastic. So for our agenda for today, uh, we're going to be reviewing the new standards. We're going to be explaining the progression, especially in the grade band from K to two. So that's our real focus today. Um, we're going to also go over how to use the standards in your classroom. What, um, what exactly is inquiry with regards to the standards and how to use those primary and secondary sources as kindergarten, first grade and second grade teachers. And then lastly, probably most importantly is how do we leverage social studies and ELA together? So that way we're working smarter, not harder. And you're making sure to get those social studies skills and um, those standards taught in your, in your classes. So first we have a poll for you. I'm gonna go ahead and launch the poll. And so if you can um, take a minute to tell me how, tell us how well do you guys know, uh, know the standards? Good, so most of you, it looks like are knowing them a little feeling kind of comfortable with them. They're very different from our old, old standards. So that is, uh, Hi. that's an adjustment. To page 50. Up to page 50? Just finished. There we go. All right, perfect. I think everyone's had it. That's great. So that gives Marie and I an idea of just how, uh, where you guys are at with regards to that. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll now. Let's see, let me show so you guys can see them. Just give me a minute there. So looks like everybody's got a really good idea. Um, hopefully our goal kind of by the end of this, um, you know, seminar that you guys will be able to, if you feel comfortable with them, you feel like you'll know them well and be able to use them. If you know them a little bit, you'll feel very comfortable with using them and build that confidence. And then if you don't know them at all, you should have a really decent handle on what they look like, how to use them by the, by the end of this. All right, so let's get going. Oops, I need to move some things around here. So what I'd like for you to do first is think of your favorite social studies teacher, or really it could just be any teacher that you've had, and what was it that made them special? And if you can type that into the chat for me, I'd appreciate it. Carrying exciting lessons. Yep. Drawing maps. Oh, I like the high energy and interesting. Vicki, that's a good one. Passionate. Uh, made the lessons engaging. Connections. Oh, I like Carrie. Bringing the lessons to life. Oh, related the content to the Navajo Nation. Fantastic. Spiraling content. Making learning relevant. Making it fun. Real life stories. Fantastic. Those are all great. Yes. So it's really this idea that it's not that students really don't hate history. It's the fact that they just kind of have hated the way we have taught it all those years. And this comes from a book called Lies My Teacher Told Me that um, by a gentleman by the name of James Lowen. And if you were like me, you probably had plenty of social studies teachers that did this, right? That did you know, the um, here, watch this video, answer these questions, you know, half the class has fallen asleep and you kind of nudge the person next to you to like, hey, what was number two? I missed that one. You're not really learning, learning anything. And so um, in that case, right, that's not really what we're, what we're going for. And that's kind of how our old standards were. So that gets to the rationale for why we changed the standards a few years ago. So here I have a, an infographer from the Council of Chief State School um, Officers. Oh, it was called Lies My Teacher Told Me by James Lowen. 
Um, and what I would like for you to do is look at this infographic. And again, you will receive all of these materials, all of the links to these materials. So that way you have them um, after I take attendance and enter the attendance into the ADE system. I will then send you an email from me personally that says, hey, your attendance is noted. Here are the resources and you will get a PDF with all of the links, the research, everything, everything on here. Um, so take a minute and look at this infographic on the mar marginalization of social studies. And I'd like for you to pick one fact that kind of stands out to you um, as you look at this infographic, please. And as you find something that kind of strikes you, um, go ahead and type that into the chat for me. Definitely the reduction of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it gets the least amount of time devoted to any of the elementary grades. We're going to get into, I'm glad you brought that up, Heather, because we are going to get into background knowledge and that content knowledge, Barbara, absolutely. Yeah, with the, the high stakes testing, most districts have, you know, decreased time for social studies. And Carrie, you're totally right. It's almost an equity issue. When reading scores go down, the first thing that it you know gets cut is social studies, and in a lot of ways, those areas that are lower socioeconomic, <coughs> excuse me, don't have the the social study skills to even advocate for themselves getting more um, things that they need. Yeah, eighth graders only being twenty three percent proficient in civics is frightening. Um, Definitely the thing that stands out, and we will again give you this infographic so that way you guys uh, will have it. Um, kids that are four times more likely to volunteer in community by learning about social studies. I like this one here in the middle that says over here on the right hand side that second graders who had 60 lessons of literacy rich social studies scored 23% higher on reading assessments. And we're going to get into some more specific research, more current research. Um, that actually proves that. But it is an equity engaged in issue as far as we want kids to know how to advocate for the things that they, that they need, that they want um, in their lives. And that's social studies is the way to do it. Plus that background knowledge is kind of, of key. Yeah, civic life is the absolute purpose of why the schools were created in the first place. So thank you, Nicole, that's spot on. So as you think about social studies and you think about teaching reading, it really is, is tied, they're the same, right? When you're teaching civics, when you're teaching economics, when you're teaching geography and history, you are teaching, teaching reading. And the social studies standards are written very purposefully that they are tied to ELA. They emphasize the same skills and practices, which um, Maria and I are gonna go into a little bit later. We very purposefully wrote them, tying the two um, content areas together. Um, it's got that nice integration and I'm all about killing two birds with one stone, right? We want to work smarter, not harder because that home family life is really important, but it's important that we give our kids that background too. So it's like, how do you balance that? And I think we as teachers very often tend to take our work home with us and so, Anytime when you can do multiple things with one lesson, I'm, we're all for that. Here's another study here um, that I wanted to go through. And this was the uh, Fordham study, which actually, wait a minute here. I'm sorry, Maria, I'm totally taking your, totally taking off. I'm, I'm gonna let Maria go now. <laughs> Fine, Linda, no worries at all, um, as long as we get the information there. Um, okay, so yes, as Linda was saying, this is a Fordham study. This one was really important. We use this a lot to share with our um, principals and administrators to really show them the research behind this. So if you look at the graph, it shows that more instructional time devoted to social studies is actually correlated with greater reading growth from first through fifth grade. And you can see that when spending 30 minutes more a day on each of these areas, 
you can see that social studies has the biggest bang for the buck. And so that's really important. And it's actually shown by research through the Sportum study. Um, it also shows all of the things that are listed here that elementary school students in the US spend much more time on ELA than any other subject. Uh, students from less affluent backgrounds, Hispanic students, and those attending public schools, traditional and charters, spend more time on ELA than do other students. Increased instructional time in social studies, but not in ELA, is associated with improved reading. And the ability, and down at number four, the students who benefit the most from additional social studies time are girls and those from lower income and or non-English speaking homes. And we're gonna get into the reasons for this in a few of these other studies. So we can go to our next one. So let's take a look at Timothy Shannon's research. This is what he says really matters most. So the reason why what students read matter most is because they have that background knowledge and they start to build those connections and that content. So you'll see that even poor readers or what we say are poor readers, those who don't have as good of skills as maybe what we would consider a good reader, when they have background knowledge that they can access and they, they know about, their reading tends to be better. They're interested, they have connections made. So this is what he says, is that what students read does matter. Make sure you're picking and selecting text that's very important with that. He also says that when we set reading goals, this will really help the students. Make sure to emphasize the content and what they are reading. He also says that break up that reading block. I know with some of us, we don't have control of a reading block. We're assigned that and we have to do it as teachers. Teachers. But we can start, if we can't break it, we can start incorporating or integrating those really rich and good social studies stories, texts, nonfiction, fiction, books, primary sources, secondary sources into that reading block so that we still are incorporating our social studies. And of course, he always says, write often and in all areas. And this is gonna be super important to write and think like historians. Making sure to include technology was a big part of what he said as well. Okay, so that was some of the research. Now, we're gonna go into a question for all of you. And we want you to think about what skills do students need to be successful in career and college life? We know they need to think and we know they need to read and we know they need to communicate, but what are the specific skills that you think students need to have? They need to be able to do this to think. They need to be able to do this to read effectively. They need to be able to do this to communicate. So we're gonna have a jam board. And if you would please take a sticky note there and start putting some of your thoughts. Um, Linda just put the Jamboard link in the chat. So you can just click on that. And the sticky note is right below the arrow once you get to the Jamboard. And you can just take a sticky note and start putting your thoughts about what skills do you think students need in these areas? And I think Linda's modeling that for us. Students need to, and then you can put what you believe. I'm gonna admit somebody, there we go. Perfect. And if Linda, if you start to see sticky notes come up and I don't, please jump in and, and read them. Sometimes others can see them for some reason, and I always struggle with being able to see them. So let's see. I do see yours there. Let's see. Enter a note here. Um, you would go click on the link that Linda put into the chat there. Oh, yeah. There you go. So sorry. I didn't see I'll the link. Put it yeah. again. Thank you. And then you just click on there. And when you get okay. there, there it is. Then you'll be able to add some sticky notes to our Jamboard. And again, the question, if you just joined us, is what skills do students need in these areas in order to be successful in college and career? And yes, the link is in the chat box. Oh, you know what? Here we go. Everyone in meeting. Let me put it oh. here. There we go. <laughs> That's now we right. should there see it. Go. There yeah. we go. Now people are in there. Perfect. Thank Perfect. you. Oh, there. Yep. I see at the top. I see everyone coming in. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we'll give everyone a minute to do that. Oh, I like visualization. That's a good one. 
that is a good one. I didn't think of that necessarily. Oh, yep, that's, I see some good ones starting to come. And you can move your um, sticky notes under where you'd like them to go once you've written, perfect. Awesome, this is how you know Jamboard's working now. You see all those sticky notes coming up, so that's fantastic. Go ahead and take about another 30 seconds and get your ideas there. Make sure you move your sticky to which area, thinking, communicating, or reading. You oh, want I love it. the one on perseverance. If you haven't yeah. used Jamboard, there are some really neat things. Like you can actually bring in pictures. You can do images. You could actually do like a laser pointer and it circles it for a while and then goes away. You could also draw on it if you wanted to like, okay, here are all of our reading ones or here are all of our thinking ones. You can then erase it. Um, as well. So there are some really neat um, interactions that you can do with, uh, with Jamboard and your students if you haven't uh, used it yet. Perfect. And we do have a few in the chat. I see perseverance in the chat. Uh, read complex text. That's a really good one. Yep. Mm -hmm. Listen and think about information, cooperative work, speak mm -hmm. in sentences, clear sentences, provide evidence to support claims, have empathy when you're communicating, stamina. These are fantastic. Yeah. They really are. Background information, absolutely. Students make connections, yep, draw conclusions. Mm -hmm. Perfect. The nice thing too, before we go on, you can yeah. actually come here and download this as a PDF. So this is kind of a nice way that you could always review or create something special for your kids um, and save it offline or save it and then, you know, print it out or do whatever you may need to with it. So, all right. I, love we, that. I didn't know that part. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So I think that you really hit on all of these things. So here's what they say you students will need to be able to think analytically. By posing and framing questions, gathering a variety of evidence, recognizing continuity and detecting change over time, utilizing, I can never say that word right, chronology to examine cause and effect relationships and drawing and combining reasonable inferences from a variety of sources to build an understanding of complex questions. A lot of these are what you already said and we know. So these are the skills that we want students to be able to have or to possess in order to be able to think critically. So really good job there. So in order to read widely and critically, look at some of these red words that stand out here some of the white ones as well, examining, interpreting, and contextualizing primary sources. I know we're kindergarten through second grade teachers, but that's so important, those primary sources. Identifying and comparing, variety of secondary sources. I think we're better at using secondary sources. The primary is always hard to get in, so that's a good one. Discern subtext. Okay, so great job on all of the ones that you had said too. Very good, and we can go to our last one. Okay, so now let's look at communicate develop and defend evidence-based arguments. I know we saw that. Multiple perspectives. That can kind of go into the empathy as well. Comprehensive explanations, practicing and cultivating a wide variety of diverse types of writing. Engage in constructive conversations. That is gonna be a huge one around historical and social science topics. When we can start engaging in that civil discourse, even when we are in kindergarten, uh, first, second grade, that's gonna so help us as we become adults and move out of high school and into college and career. So great job there. So Sam Weinberg, who is from the Stanford History Education Group said this, and this really goes back to what uh, Linda was saying earlier in the presentation about your memories of your history teacher. You didn't say you love the ones who made you memorize facts, right? We said the ones who provided hands-on learning. So he says, our job is not to give kids the answers. Our job is to give them problems to solve and the tools that they need to solve them. And this is gonna align very well with our new standard. So we're gonna take a look now at the shifts and changes. So now let's talk about some of those shifts and changes that will support what Sam Weinberg said is best teaching practice. As you can see here, the first graphic says that we're now gonna have focus that progresses from individual students starting in kindergarten, really focuses on the individual student, and then it's going to get broader and broader to the worldwide view within each grade level. And you'll see that um, when you see the K through 12 really articulation there. 
Um, okay, the next one is grade level standards are written to support the anchor standards. So we're gonna have these 21 anchor standards of what students should be able to know and do by the time they leave high school. And each of your grade level standards are gonna be written to support that. The next one is that we have skill complexity, which is gonna increase from grade to grade. I think that one makes sense for all of us. And that each grade band focuses on embedded inquiry-based learning and critical thinking. So you're gonna really see a shift into, uh, instead of that memorizing and learning about specific events and dates in isolation, we're gonna be learning about compelling and supporting questions and inquiry and really getting the students engaged. Okay, and then our next one will give us the shifts and changes that are more specific. I think really for kinder first and second grade, the first two apply the most. And that's that US and world history standards are now combined into one strand of just history. And that personal finance is now taught in kindergarten through 12th grade. So those are the two that affect you the most. You can take a look at the other ones just so you can see how things have shifted around. Okay, but those first two are gonna be the ones that affect you the most. Okay, Linda, back to you now. Awesome. So the structure of the standards is very different from what it was before. And this gets to our second Sam Weinberg quote, which is the mind demands pattern and form, which build up slowly and require repeated passes with each pass going deeper and probing further. And that's essentially the crux of the standards. The standards are not um, a one and done thing. This looked like my son's, you know, bedroom before he went away to college his freshman year. You had no idea what was there. You didn't know where the smell was coming from. You had, it was just, you were completely lost, right? That was our old standards. It was just like a checklist. You don't know what you've got, but our new standards now are much more organized. You use them multiple times and we're going to demonstrate and show how you do that and, and how you, um, how effective that is. And again, each time you use these standards, you will see your students will progress and get better and better as the time goes on. So what are the new standards? They are absolutely focused on inquiry and questions. They're very broad, which I know gives a lot of people a little bit of pause because they're not explicit and they're, they're meant to be easily adapted depending upon different locations and what you, the needs are for your students and the, your surrounding community. Um, they're very flexible in that way and they do show a clear progression. When my children were going through elementary school, it was like third grade was one thing and then they hopped over to Mesopotamia, then they went back to ancient Greece and then you know a teacher loved Rome so they learned some stuff about Rome and it was this kind of hodgepodge all over the place. Well, now there's a very clear progression that starts with our little people in kindergarten and like Maria had said earlier, grows as they grow. So as they're develop and their cognition grows bigger, they, you know, the standards grow, grow bigger too. Um, again, they're not a, a checklist of one and done kind of things. They're not inflexible and they very purposely are not meant to stand alone. They're meant to be tied with, with ELA. So the social study standards have some different components to kind of go through. And the first are the course considerations. So in the email I sent out to you, I sent you a link to the ADE website where you can download the standards or at least look at the standards. Um, at the very top of those standards is a bulleted list or the, the storyline is what we're calling them for elementary. And those bulleted items are, that's essentially your content, right? Those are the themes, the units that you're going to want to create and develop over the course of your school year. And so that's the content is those course considerations. And then you have the actual, um, standards, which are in five categories. So we first have disciplinary skills and processes. So these are our critical thinking standards. These are the ones that are um, historical thinking skills, thinking like an economist, like a geographer, like Maria had said, you're using the primary sources to answer these kinds of questions. And then you have content in civics, economics, geography, and history. And economics is probably the one thing that I think gives elementary teachers the most heart palpitations because very few people, myself included, never took an economics class in, in college. And so how on earth are you supposed to teach economics to first graders, right? But I will, I promise you, there are some great resources and we will lead you to them today that have wonderful lessons that can help fill the gaps and do what you, do what you need to do for that. 
So with regards to the standards, these are our anchor standards. And like Maria had said, these are what we want kids to master by the time they graduate high school. So for your little people in kindergarten, first and second grade, yes, they are you know, examining the human population and movements that help individuals understand like past, present and future of the earth's conditions, right? But they're doing it at a grade level appropriate way. Okay. Yes, they're learning about personal finance and individual understanding how to manage and spend. But again, that's at a level for kindergartners that's appropriate, right? If you talk about needs and wants, that's economics. And so that's what we're, that's what you'll see. And so these are what we want kids to know and master by the time they graduate high school. But it starts, it starts right away in kindergarten. Here is the progression that Maria had mentioned earlier that changed. So we start with children as citizens, and then as they get to develop this community at school, it changes and gets a little bit bigger in first grade. In second grade, it's the world around me, which is really broad, but the reason for that is to be adaptable to whatever reading program your school or district may have. And so we wanted teachers to have that flexibility. Then it gets to Arizona, then Americas, then we get to the beginnings of the US, um, and then sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, look at the world, and then kind of a capstone eighth grade with civics, and now what are you going to, to do with it? So when we look at, this is the storyline. So these are the three of the grade band that we're focusing on for this seminar. And so again, here we have kindergarten, and I'm gonna go pretty quick through these because we can pick up time and I want you guys to use them. But these are the course considerations that I was mentioning earlier. These are the bulleted um, items or the content that you want to be teaching in kindergarten. So importance of rules, um, individual roles in a community, decision-making, familiarity with geographic models. So that would be working with maps and other items, um, culture and American symbols, right? And then these are the five then content areas of as far as like the actual standards. So you're gonna learn and talk about chronological reasoning. Well, kindergartners can learn what comes first, what comes second, what comes third, right? That's chronological reasoning done at a kindergarten level. Um, and then you'll see different things like civic virtues, uh, human environment interactions, little ones can easily very much, you know, pick this up and do it. Then as we go into first grade, again, here now are our content and the bulleted list of understanding perspectives of others, school community functions of government, earning, spending, and saving money, here we have again using geographic models. So again, it's that repeated pass, right? That Sam Weinberg had mentioned. The effects of human movement, cooperation, compromise, and American symbols. And if you look in the actual content, you know, specific standards, here we see again disciplinary skills, right? Kids are doing chronological reasoning again in first grade, that repeated practice, right? So the more they practice it, they get better. Human environment interactions comes up again civic virtues and democratic principles comes up again. Now, of those 21 anchor, um, anchor standards, right? What we did was we broke them up so you don't have to do every single one in every single grade, but you do, a student will hit all 21 at least once throughout the grade band. So some of them may show up in kindergarten and first, some of them may show up just in first, some of them may show up in kinder and second, some may do first and second, but ultimately by the time a student leaves second grade, they will have hit all 21 of those grade ba those anchor standards at least once in an age appropriate, uh, age appropriate manner. And then lastly, second grade here, we're working together. Again, our content is working together to solve problems, individual and leadership roles, identifying regions and using geographic models, earning, spending, and saving money, influence of weather and climate, which is just a great way to bring in some science, right? Again, killing two birds with one stone, development and culture of civilizations and, and uh, change of cultures and civilizations, societal institutions. And then here we have, notice it's a little bit more because you know, as second graders, they can process more and, and do more. And so again, that's kind of that building upon that we have before. So you see things like chronological reasoning again, because it's really important that kids understand that. Um, but here notice the civics is a little different, right? We're talking now about citizen rights, roles and responsibilities, um, laws, uh, financial literacy. What does that mean to be financially literate? Um, some again, human environment interactions. Here we have cycles of conflict. Um, 
Yeah, sure thing. I will send these to you so you will have them, but I can go back real quick for them. So here's uh, Kinder. And then here is first grade. And again, you'll see some kind of common, common themes uh, throughout the standards, but keep in mind that these are the, the content and then over here, the actual like the SP or the H1 or the C1, that's the standards then that you use to teach that, that content. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Maria. Perfect, thank you. I had to just unmute there. So also too, look, I, I, it's so important what Linda said is those disciplinary skills and process standards are going to be your direct link to your ELA standards. If you take a look at what those are, you'll see that those tie in with ELA beautifully. So that's gonna be a direct link between your social studies and your ELA, ELA how to focus in on that. So let's take a look now at the reading standards and your ELA standards that you can use with social studies. These are the ones that are very similar and that support your ELA reading. So if you look in social studies, we're evaluating an argument or a claim. Let's look in ELA, evaluate an argument along with reasoning or relevance. In social studies, determine main idea, identify and analyze evidence. In ELA, determine the main idea of a text, make logical references with analysis. Social studies, comprehend complex and difficult texts and identify and evaluate information in multiple media forms. Let's look at ELA, interpret phrases, phrases and structure of text along with point of view, identify and evaluate text from diverse media. So you can see that these sets of standards are very similar and this will cause, cause and allow you to do integration in your ELA and social studies. Let's go ahead and take a look now at the writing standards. I'll let you look down that list of social studies make an argument using evidence, tell a story, apply appropriate technology, gather multiple sources of information into projects. In ELA, very similarly, we're gonna write an argument using reasoning and evidence. We're gonna write narratives and informative text. We're gonna use technology to produce and publish and use multiple sources to write and research projects. So again, the alignment is there. Okay, and the last one we have is the communication standards. So let's take a look at that. In social studies, collaborate with diverse partners, design and deliver a presentation, present information that is not totally written in text, and use multiple modes of communication. And then in ELA, collaborate with diverse partners, evaluate information presented in diverse media, evaluate point of view, design and deliver a presentation, use multiple forms of media to express information. Um, and I'm sorry, there was a question. Oh, Linda, thank you. And yes, again, those are going to directly link with each other. So Integration into social studies and ELA is not only possible, it's in the standards, okay? All right, let's take a look at a reflection now. And on the next slide, we're gonna want you to think about what are some threads that you saw that were consistent throughout each grade level band? And you can type your answer in the chat and think back to the bubbles that you saw when Linda was presenting. What are some threads that you see consistent throughout each of the grade level bands? Okay, let's take a look. Some are starting to come in. No the community. community. Mm -hmm. Good. It's a great one. What else do you guys think? Yeah, that is so true. And that's a good point. That being able to have a student say what happens first, what happens next, what happens last, that really could move them into writing, right? So good. Cooperation and patterns, structure, absolutely. Good, I love these. These are great, great threads that you can see that really intertwine between kinder first and second grade and also between ELA and social studies that really start to build reading, writing and communication. Community and structure just came through as well. Great, another community. So yep, so you can see, and you can see also that it starts with the little person in kindergarten and starts to build out. And yes, perspective is going to be a really good point as well. Um, and again, leads right into ELA. We talk about author's perspective, right, in ELA, okay? One thing that I'm gonna, I'll show at the end though, we have created a direct crosswalk between social studies and ELA that will show you where that is. So that way, when you teach something, you can say, oh, this is tying in the ELA. And we've kind of done that, that back work, um, back work for you guys. Perfect. Well, these are great. I think, I think that's a great reflection. You really seem to be seeing those threads. So thank you guys for that participation. 
Awesome. So now we're going to focus on really getting to, again, because we wanted this seminar to be useful to you. I've, I've, you know, taught for over 20 years. I've been in some of those painful PD where you're like, oh, for the love of Buddha, just give me one thing I can take out of this that's positive. We want you to have so much that you just, it's, it's great, right? You come out of this feeling. So we, now that we've kind of gone through the standards for the past 30 minutes, we really want you to see how you can use these and adapt these into your classroom and really get comfortable using, using them. So we're gonna look at inquiry because that's really a big part of the standards. And like Maria had said, that's the easiest and biggest way, um, most common way that ELA and social studies kind of uh, work, work together. So we're going to do one together first. And this activity is called Observe, Reflect, Question. And it's through the Library of Congress, which is a great website. And it's got so much stuff out there that you can get lost down the rabbit hole. But really, you could, it starts with just taking a simple picture. So finding maybe a picture that goes off of your theme. And I'll show you some resources and, and links to that later um, and, and going from there. But I'm going to actually take you through this. So you do this activity like a student. And we'll see exactly how much um, inquiry gets into it just from one picture. So the first thing I want you to do, and you're going to be typing this into the chat for me, is just observe and describe what you see. No analysis, no, no thoughts, just describe what you see and type that into the chat. And so I've done this with um, middle school kids. I've done it with high school kids. It's great with elementary kids. Um, so when we look at this picture, and this picture is from the Library of Congress, what do you see? Perfect, people by the Statue of Liberty, immigrants coming to America, hope people on a boat. And you always want to, when you're doing this with your children and your students ask them questions, well, how do you know it's the Statue of Liberty, right? Some of them ha may have that background knowledge to know that, some of them may not, you know? And so then they're, they're learning. Women and children, boats, immigrants. What, and again, what makes you think that it's immigrants, right? And you're asking the student to back up what they think is evidence. So if you think it's immigrants, what evidence do you have from the picture that, oh, these are, these are immigrants? And maybe you might say it's the different, different kinds of clothes, right? They're looking at the Statue of Liberty, um, joyfulness, they're by the water, lots of hats. Um, yep, different types of people, babies, ships, perfect, right? So that's exactly what you want to do. You wanna take, um, take that and just, you know, what do you see? Then after this, now you reflect. And so now I'm gonna ask you, what, is, what do you think is happening in this picture? So some of you had this idea that, oh, it might be hope or joyfulness, um, but what are some other thoughts? So type that into the chat for me. What do you think is happening in this, in this picture? What makes you think uh, freedom, Virginia? That's what I'm, you know, so again, right? Asking, uh, asking evidence. Anxious for something to go, wondering what they're looking at, moving to a home, possible anxiety. Yeah, you could bring in a second picture and do a compare and contrast. You know, again, evidence, why do they see, where do you see evidence that they are confused? It's like, oh, well, you can see maybe right here, there, you know, some of the looks on their faces, maybe there's that, somebody said like anxiety before. So you can say the, the worried look on their faces. Um, they're pointing at something um, close to arriving at a new and exciting place. They could be arriving to America, right? We know that they are because of the Statue of Liberty, but wondering what their new home would be like exactly. So there's something where they are, something is going on that they're looking at and watching, right? And then the last piece of this activity is question. What are you curious about going forward? So now that we know that these are recent immigrants, they're actually on the dock. There is a boat here that's kind of moored up next to it. You can see other boats in the background. Um, what do you think, what are you curious about going forward? And one thing that I've done with this, because I love to use art and images in my classes, um, I will take these and if you laminate them, the, your pictures, you can print them out. And especially if you print out color pictures, laminate them, and then you can get those vis-a-vis -vis markers and have your kids um, annotate on the picture, just like you would have them maybe annotate a, um, a, a document or something, you know, have them, you know, circle, uh, uh, you know, draw a line to it or, you know, note all the hats and, and scarves, something like that. 
these are great chicken. Why are there no children? Where are they coming from? Where will they go after this landing? Oh, I like, where will they stay? Um, why are people all wearing hats and stuff? Yeah, because people don't really wear hats very often now. I mean, think about doing this with your kids, right? There are all sorts of ways in which, you know, how, how do you do this, you know? You could also take this and put it in, besides laminating it, you could also, if you have a sheet protectors, you can slide the picture inside the sheet protector and then you can annotate on top of the sheet protector with a vis-a-vis -vis marker. Um, there are things like through the Oriental Trading Company that you can actually buy annotation kind of sleeves. Um, but me, I'm cheap. So I just laminated the heck out of everything and then I use it year after year, right? Um, and the, the visual strategy is huge. And that's part of, of the ELA literacy too. When they say text, it doesn't mean just, you know, um, uh, you know written text. It's images are, are text. Media is a text that you need to look at. And especially for emerging readers or maybe readers that are struggling, images are the best way to, to get it. So that's perfect. All right, we are going to have you go back to the Jamboard here. And on page two, I'm gonna have you guess from doing just that one little activity that we've done for you know, 10, 15 minutes, how many uh, standards do you think we covered in that one activity? So if you come here and let me just type the chat or put this back into the chat again for the Jamboard. If up here, if you click on page two, you'll see that there are a whole bunch of little circles here. I'm gonna just delete this one here. You can grab a circle and move it and guess, and if you wanna add another circle, wherever, but just take a guess and let's see how many standards do you think were used in this one inquiry? Looks like we're averaging around 10. Seven, good. Just give like a minute more for people to answer. Just another way in which you can use a uh, Jamboard to do something and have your kids uh, respond. Okay, it looks like the circles have stopped moving. So it looks like we're right around, hovering around 10 for our, our average here. So let's go ahead and go back. And if we looked at the second grade standards for this one inquiry that we did, it actually covers 17 second grade standards just in this one inquiry. So we're doing and covering things of the, the SPs are the disciplinary skills and processes. So like Maria had said, right? Those are the inquiry ones. Those are the ones that are gonna have more explicit ties to ELA. Um, and we compared diverse cultures from around, compare perspectives, um, identify facts. We gathered relevant information from one or two sources. Um, you're asking explanations. So just by doing this one inquiry of all your standards in second grade, we've covered 17 of them. And this again gets to that Sam Weinberg um, quote, where you're doing these standards over and over again and each pass the kids get better. And also I've gone through here too, and as a side note, we covered 10 ELA standards. So that's fantastic, right? Again, work smarter, not harder, you know, and you're doing a lot of this prep, but your kids are doing the work of historians, right? They're making those connections um, as, we, as we go through it. So one thing that's kind of nice, and, and another thing too, like how, how do you go and where do you go to prompt your kids for, for questions as you're doing an activity like this, where you're coming up and finding maybe a historical picture or an image, great place. And again, like I said, this observer fact question comes from the Library of Congress. And so this will be hyperlinked for you. So you can actually click on this and it will take you, I will just show you here um, what it kind of looks like as it comes out, but essentially they have observe, reflect, question, primary analysis tools for every kind of primary source you can think of. So maybe if you're doing a map, you can click here and do the map ones. If you're doing a newspaper, a political cartoon, 
uh, a sound recording, um, a motion picture, all different, all different kinds here. But it's nice that it gives you questions that you can prompt your kids through. What do you notice first? What do you see something small that might be interesting to you? Um, what did you notice that you didn't expect? And so there are all sorts of questions that are already done for you that in this case, as you're going through, you can ask them and answer them. Another one I wanted to show you that is great is uh, the National Archives. And they have the same type of activity because this is just a great basic activity that you could use with any visual or, or primary source that you wanted to. But this is one, say you're analyzing a political cartoon. So what do you see? Is the cartoon in black and white? Is there a caption? Um, what did the caption tell you? And then looking at the parts of it. Again, this is hyperlink. And one thing that I like too, because you know how we all kind of switch grades and some years you're teaching, now you're gonna have to go up to fourth grade and what are you gonna do to teach that? The one thing that I like about the National Archives is that they have taken their same thing, their document analysis, they have them for all these different types of primary sources. So a map, a cartoon, a video, an artwork, but they've made them and adapted them for like intermediate grades and secondary students, but they also have them then for also for younger grades or if maybe you need some kids that have remediation or you've got a student with ELL. So it is this, the one thing that's nice about the National Archive ones, if you do ever switch grades and have to teach some of those upper grade levels, it's nice that they've kind of adapted them already and created that differentiation um, for you. And again, these are all hyperlinked off of the PDF that you guys will get in a few days um, from me in the email. So you can look for that. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Maria. Awesome. Okay, so now let's talk about what a primary source is. It's important to know, and it's actually in the standards that students will be able to know and use primary and secondary sources. So let's spend a minute taking a look at some primary sources here on this page. A primary source is an immediate firsthand account of a topic. It's from people who had a direct connection with that event or that time period, who experienced it, who lived it, the photo was from that time period. And here's some examples. These can primary sources can be letters, they can be maps, these, as you'll see the pictures here, they can be photographs, art, political cartoons, music is a great primary source, especially for our young kids. Um, well, older ones too, but that music, they love that in those little grades. Um, oral histories, artifacts are really cool too, as you'll see in the last picture there. So remember that these are those firsthand accounts from that time period. And the great thing about a primary source is that another standard that we have is for students to be able to ask and answer questions. And I think as teachers, <clears throat> excuse me, we're really good about coming up with the questions and asking the students, but we really want the students to start generating questions on their own. And of course, as us to guide them, and I will tell you, and I know I saw Carrie has done this with her students, when you put a primary source up for a student of a picture back from 1700 or 1800, the students are going to come up with all kinds of questions. And so that really promotes that standard of them being able to generate questions. Okay, so now let's look at what a secondary source is. So here are some of the secondary sources. You'll see they look different. The secondary sources are the ones that are like one step removed from a primary source. These are often, um, they can cover the same topic, but they can be like an account of, of what happened during a certain time period. Um, these, let's see, these add a layer of inter interpretation and analysis, and they can include things like biographies, um, news articles, maybe that we're talking about a time period, um, a book review, uh, what else, magazine, um, we said biographies, some documentaries. So these are like those secondhand accounts. This doesn't have to be from the time period. They're usually just a supporting document that can, or supporting something that can go with that firsthand um, account of, primary, of the primary source. Linda, I just want to make sure, do you want to add anything about secondary sources? Um, I, th I think the, the big thing for secondary sources, and it might be better for like older kids, is the idea that it can corroborate what you may see in a primary source. So maybe if you see a, a picture of, um, uh, say, something in the community, right, and then you read a story about that community, okay, that's that can be a corroborating 
um, secondary sources, something like backs up or provides more evidence for what you see in those primary sources. I like that. Thank you. Yeah. So the primary sources are usually easier to identify than the secondary sources. So, so I wanted to make sure we uh, clarified secondary really well for them. And then I think you're up for the next one. Yeah, so one thing I wanted to show you is just again, like, where do you go to get all of these? And the nice thing about the, the Library of Congress is that they have created um, already some teacher sets. And there are a couple of different ways and places you can go to get these. Um, so if we just click here, this takes you out to the main um, Library of Source webpage. And again, this will be hyperlinked. So when you get the PDF, it's nice. So they have some here that are already um, curated together. So like here's some Arizona ones. Here's ones about the 19 um, different authors. Some of these might be a little old for, you know, a K2 grade band, but you never know. It depends on what kind of books and what units you want to create with your school to teach those things. But here, baseball across the changing nation, you can find some American symbols in there um, and you can search by level. Again, like I said, they're mostly for older kids, but don't discount them, right? Anything can be used and adapted down for, you know, for just like a, a picture like that we just went to. One thing that's nice when you do search on something, if you search, um, say, let's say baseball, you want to do a backslash uh, dot L O C sorry, backslash L O C dot gov. And that brings up all of the uh, things that the Library of Congress has. And that's kind of nice. There is another, um, so here's all the baseball stuff that they happen to have. So here you can get into some uh, stuff about New York, you've got African-American identity. So you can find all different kinds of just pictures, right? And do that exact same thing that what we did um, with, um, with your students for the observe, reflect, and question. There is another uh, group called the Teaching with Primary Sources that is like a community you can join. And I have a link to that later on, but that's another place that you can also, also go for um, Library of Congress stuff as well. All right, back to you, Maria. Perfect. Okay, so now we want you to take a look at this slide. Oh, it's coming. There it is. And we want you to look at the pictures here. And we want you to think about how do you know or how would a student know if a source is reliable? Let's take a look. The one that always stands out to me is the picture at the top that says more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Interesting, right? So Linda and I are actually teaching another class uh, on July 8th and the registration is still open for this. And it's all about looking at media literacy. And so if you are more interested in this topic and how to do this with your students of really taking sources and seeing if they're credible or not credible, uh, we would love to have you in that class. So you can go to ADE and Lisa, uh, Linda will show you that at the end. Um, I think a little bit about how to register for those other classes. So it's open. Oh, she just put the link in there. Thank you so much. You can go and register for this class as well. Um, so we're going to take a look now. And I think if you click, there's our question, how do I know if this source is reliable? Well, let's take a look. We, we talked about primary sources. And we talked about secondary sources, and we're gonna move you through how to determine uh, if these are reliable sources or not. So let's take a look at our next slide here. In the chat box, you're gonna answer a question for me in just a second. The question is, who was present at the signing of the Declaration of Independence? Okay, and I want you to think, if your students were going to go and find the answer to this question, would you want them to look at source one, which is a Hollywood movie about the American Revolution made in 2001, or would you like them to go to source two, which is a book written by a historian who is an expert on the American Revolution and it was published in 1999. So in the chat, please tell us if you would pick source one or source two and why would you trust it more? So I see lots of source two starting to come up, but tell us why, why would you pick that one over source one? Or if you're picking source one, why would you pick that one? Good. I see source two because it says he's an expert. He's a historian. Okay, very good. Okay, I see one says source two, but maybe check number one and compare them. Oh, that's a great idea, right? We talked about 
those primary and secondary sources and how they can help support each other. And experts providing the information, yeah, because he's a historian, he's a writer. Yeah, the person is a historian, good. So I think we're all in agreement that source two is going to be where we would want the kids to go and why. And you can start explaining that to the students about why somebody who's a historian, right, might have a better, um, a better ability to give us facts and why Hollywood shows us more of a story that might tug on a heartstring or might be more of something that they show us as interesting instead of actually what happened. And I saw one Hollywood movie produced, yes, in 2000. Oh, okay, yeah. So there are definitely movies that, especially nowadays, I feel like they're really doing a good job. Like some of even the, the shows that, that uh, we watch on Netflix, a lot of them are made in conjunction with like the History Channel and things like that. So I feel like sometimes they're starting to get better at putting those together. So you can explain that to the children and make sure that they understand why Source 2 would be a more credible source. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at this very famous painting of Washington crossing the Delaware. And I want you, if you know this, this painting or this period of time, in the chat, can you start to type in some things that you see that might not be true or might not be accurate about this picture? Oh, there's a woman rowing. Oh, wow, yep, yeah. okay. Looks cold, okay, good. What else might not be accurate about this time period or about what happened at this event? Because this is a very famous painting. The flag, that's a great one, yes. So the time period is 1851 when this painting was done. Oh, I like There's this Washington a, really leading. That's a good one too. That is a really good one. Time of day, that's another really good one, yes. Great job, the boat. Absolutely, number of people that could fit in a boat. Fantastic. So yes, you know that when this person, his name was, I think it's Emmanuel, is it Lutz? Maybe, I think how do so, you say yeah. his last name? Lutz um, or Lutz, yeah. Lutz maybe, yes. I so I'm not positive. I'm not positive either, but uh, it's, um, he's the one that, that created the painting. And I believe he was from Germany when he created the painting. And you can tell he definitely took some creative liberties. So although, we have a painting and it was done that was, you know, during a time period, we want to make sure that we point out to the students that sometimes in paintings that the, um, the person does take these creative liberties and we want to make sure that we talk to them about what's accurate, what's not accurate. So you guys really did hit it on the head that this, the, the actual event that happened in this picture happened in the middle of the night. It did not happen, um, you know, this kind of looks like maybe it's either early in the morning or going into the evening, but this mm -hmm. event actually occurred in the middle of the night. There was a really bad storm, so there wasn't kind of this after effect of the storm. These boats were not accurate. The flag was not an accurate flag that would have been uh, for that time period. Um, there would never be people standing in the boats. Um, it was more like cargo sort of boats that they were on, is from what I believe. So yeah, so this is great. So you really need to teach students to question and be able to talk to them about, hmm, let's take a look, let's do our own research about this and have them start to come up with the questions about what is important in the painting and what might not be true. Okay, let's go on to our next one. All right. You know what? Um, it's been about an hour. Let's go ahead and take the break now. Let's give you guys just five minutes to go to the restroom, grab some water, um, just stretch your legs for a minute because two hours to sit still is a lot even for adults. So let's, um, I'm going to pause the recording and we'll be back and we'll give you five minutes. So at 2.06, we're going to start right on time. Um, and uh, all right, so we have talked often about inquiry and what, what this looks like and how do you do this in the class. And so we've shown you an observe, reflect, wonder. Maria took you through that great thing about sourcing and what, you know, to ask those questions and in inquiry. But what I'd like to show you is a, kind of a more of a of what I call a formal inquiry, where it's really focused on those historical thinking skills. It's on the why. Like Maria had said, we want to ask kids questions, 
but we want our students to start developing their own questions and investigating things where they're coming up with questions and then wanting to answer them. And the nice thing about inquiry is that it can be formal and long like I'm gonna show you, but it can also be a starter, it could be an exit ticket, it can be something that's really quick, you know, just like you've got 15 minutes before you have to take them to uh, their special. So, hey, let's do this little quick inquiry. There are many different ways in which you, you can do this. So I'm gonna take you through what we have, um, what is through an organization called the C3. And C3 inquiry started out as a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities to the state of New York to develop these inquiries. And once they developed them, then other states have kind of hopped on. And it's become this open education resource, or we are, if you've heard of that, where you can download things, it's for free, you can mash them up, you can use all of it, some of it, none of it, it totally just depends on what you want to do. Um, but they're completely free. The one thing I will say with the, the C3 is that um, because they are done by states, some states teach different subjects at different times. So if you go out there and look and we'll give you the links for it, um, definitely search by topic rather than by subject, um, by grade level. But I wanted to take you through, through an inquiry. And so we're going to look through this one called, um, do we have to have rules? And again, these can all be modified, but essentially this is their template that they have here on the right-hand side, where it starts off with an, a compelling question, an overarching question. Um, and then it, you start staging the question, and then you have supporting questions underneath that, which really kind of scaffold the students to answering that question. And then you end an inquiry with some kind of summative performance task. It doesn't have to be always written. Um, and the nice thing with the C3 that I really appreciate is that it has um, a, a piece of taking informed action where the kids get more involved and take this question and this inquiry um, a step further outside of the classroom, maybe outside of the school, whatever, whatever it may be. So we're gonna kind of go through this inquiry and show you what exactly it is. So it starts with staging the question. So in this case, we want the students to brainstorm what a rule is and why it is considered um, important to follow rules. And again, using images, especially for our young kiddos, right? This is actually, you can make it local. So this is a picture from an intersection in Flagstaff, right? And this is what's great is you can take these and modify them for your neighborhood. Go out and take a picture um, when you are out by your school of maybe the, the intersection right by your school and use that. And maybe you can say, okay, what rules do you see being followed in this picture? And you can have kids, you know, come up with them and ask different kinds of things like, you know, speed limits, stop signs, stop lights, um, you know, and then other kinds of things where you could ask them about, you know, maybe signage or the trees or, or whatever it may be, right? What kind of rules would they say, but it's always the starting the question. And I do advocate really taking these and make them local, make them yours, make them your own. There's nothing that stops you copyright wise from, from doing that. And it's gonna make it more meaningful for your kids. So after we have students brainstorm, what is a rule? Why do we consider it important to follow rules? Then we take them into the next supporting question. So in this case, question number one starts with what are my values? and how do I show them? And the nice thing about the C3 is that they have already given you both the primary and secondary sources, and they've already excerpted them down. So sometimes when you go out, say, to the, to the Library of Congress, um, you know, you may find an excerpt of something, or you may find a document or something like that. They've already taken those and made them most, you know, for grade appropriate. And even if, say, in, in second grade, you're using a kindergarten one, that's fine. You're kind of within that grade range, right? Um, and it's nice that they've already done that. So in this case, you have two sources, right? What are my values? And then you have an image from um, a help wanted ad from 1915 and an image from 2015. And what you have to do as a class, and obviously with some assistance, right, you want your kids from these two sources to list examples of values and explain how we show our values. So how are the values that we have shown in those help wanted ads? And so you take the kids through, through that activity. Then you do supporting question number two, 
can we make classroom rules that reflect different values? And so you see source A would be an image, which is the great seal of the United States. So all the different pieces of it with the eagle and the arrows and you know everything that's in there, right? What do each of those things mean? Which is great going over symbols and American symbols. And then you also have an excerpt from the Dignity for All Students Act that you read to your kids and then discuss it. And then the uh, formative assessment that this inquiry takes you through is to then categorize, categorize, excuse me, values and establish a set of classroom rules. So this is a great inquiry to do at the beginning of school, right? For what kind of classroom rules you want. Then last, we have supporting question three, which is what would happen if we did not have rules? So you've got two articles here. One says school ditches rules and loses bullies. And another source that says, why do we need rules? Another uh, little article to read. And at this one, the students are creating a two-sided argument chart with reasons for having rules and reasons for not having rules. And so it's great because all three of these questions ultimately lead the kids back to that larger overarching compelling question of do we have to have rules? And from this, you can see kids could answer these in multiple different ways, right? And so depending upon what evidence they want to use, that's what they're going to, how they're going to answer that final, final kind of summative summative question. And it's nice because you could do all of this, you could do part of it. If you only have time to maybe do this supporting question number three, then great, only do question number three. And that's the nice piece about the C3. And then lastly, we have the summative task where we're having our students create an argument supported with evidence from, you know, the three things that we did here, right? Our three sets of sources here. Um, they're making an argument that answers that question of whether rules are necessary or whether rules are not necessary. And then you can always expand this further by expressing arguments in the letter that maybe responds to a kindergartner. If you're maybe a second grade, or how do you respond to a kindergartner in that way? And then you can also take a formed action where maybe you have the students understand what the school rules are in light of our values and do they reflect our values um, you can discuss how school rules maybe don't necessarily reflect values, but would be have alternative rules. And then you can also act, right, where you have your class maybe want to meet with the principal to discuss um, any maybe rules that could be revised or something. And this is what I love is that idea that it can take this idea of social studies and it pushes it further out into really having an impact and making it relevant for the kids, because I think that's a big thing. Why bother learning it if it doesn't, you know, impact me in some in some way? So real quick, just doing taking it through. If you did this entire inquiry as a guess, um, and we won't go to the Jamboard. I'll just have you guys put it into the the chat. Guess the number of standards that we used in just this one inquiry. Do 20, 15, 20, 25, 18, definitely higher this time, 23. Good. 19, 18, 12, 15, 20, 17. All right, let's go ahead and look here. So for this one inquiry, if you did the entire inquiry from start to finish, and again, you don't have to because it's an OER site, you can take it and mash it. Um, in this case, these are all the second grade standards if you did this in a second grade classroom. So we would have covered 15 standards just by doing this one inquiry. And if you notice, here are some of the ones and the reason why I chose second grade again was to show that we did some of these inquiry standards a second time. So in the first one, when we identified facts, concepts associated with compelling and certain important questions, that was done at Observe, Reflect, and Wonder. Um, generate questions about a particular source that relates to an event or development. We did that one before. So this is, again, that Sam Weinberg, right? With those repeated passes, our kids are going to get better and better at this. And as we start with them as, you know, kindergartners and first graders and second graders going over this stuff, you know, it, they just will keep getting better and better. And then I did go through and look at our ELA crosswalk and we covered 16 ELA sources 
um, or standards, excuse me, by doing this one, one inquiry. And so that's kind of, of nice as far as that goes. Again, working smarter, not harder, and also getting to what Maria said too, which we haven't mentioned much again, is that idea of getting, removing those, the block times. It shouldn't be that you're just doing your reading or ELA work, okay, put away that, and now we're gonna be doing social studies or science. It should all be married together. And it shouldn't be, you know, that this idea of only ELA, only social studies, because by combining the two, that's when the kids are getting the most bang for their buck. And that's where they're getting that background knowledge that will lead to those um, increases in test scores that we saw from the, the Fordham study. So I just wanted to show you too, and again, you'll get all this when we get through, but I went through all of the C3 inquiries and I went through and found the ones that tie mostly with kindergarten and mostly with first grade and with second grade. And so these are all hyperlinked out. Again, you can mix and match some of these and apply, you know, some of them that are in first grade might apply to second grade. But for example, here, if you click on this link here for families, it will take you out to the C3. And again, it will ask you to join, but you don't have to join, but I've taken you straight out here. You can download it as a PDF or you can download it as a Word doc, which is nice because then you can edit it right in the Word doc, take out what you want, add what you want. Like I said, I put that picture of Flagstaff in so that way you can make it more local for the staging, the questions. So feel free to do it. And it's nice you can come out here and look through these and decide, okay, is this really what I want to do? Does this apply with this unit or maybe talk with the other you know, grade level um, teachers to see if this is what you want to do and you can go from there. And so these are all, all of these are hyperlinked out. Like here's an economic one, right? So if we need to hit some economic lessons because we haven't done economics in second grade, here's one um, from New York, what makes um, me become we. So again, you've got these overarching compelling questions that don't necessarily have one right answer or one wrong answer, but it's the idea that the kids are asking the questions and then they're deciding using evidence which way they want to answer and how they want to answer that final final question. And so these I've kind of set out, but don't again, some of the first grade ones might apply to second grade or whatever, but again, um, do that. So now I'm going to turn it over to Maria for some just kind of different kinds of inquiries for you. Yeah, so we're going to look at two other ones that are so cool. And I know Linda showed me or introduced me to this next one, and it is called hexagons. So if you want to take a look at that one, Linda, there you go. Um, this one is so cool that this one uses hexagons that you can either put pictures, uh, especially for our littles, pictures are great, onto the hexagons, words, phrases, and you can, the students will be able to move and manipulate and categorize. They can, um, you can print them and cut them out and the kids can move them around. There's a way to do it on um, the computer as well. And here you can see the students from their printed ones, they're, they're working together. So again, getting that collaboration skills and they're deciding where these are going to connect. So you're, the students are making categories with their hexagons and then they're linking their hexagons. And this picture is so important because, and I know this looks like it's maybe for a little bit of older students, but I want you to just think how you could modify this for the little, the K2. But what this is showing is that the students have now linked and categorized their hexagons with these words and phrases on them. And then what they've done is they've titled them. So you can see they put words to associate them with, with each of these categories economy, military, politics, and you can see their arrows. So now they're making those connections, right? Which happens first, second, third, or which is moving from one event to the next event. And then eventually what this is going to turn into or what it can turn into is it's gonna turn into a writing. And this is gonna provide the structure for your writing. And you can see how this could um, start to become topic sentences and details. So just think of maybe how we could alter that down for your littles. And I believe you have this link, Linda, to go right to this hexagons creator. So if you wanna click there and just show them quickly what it looks like, this is one way of making it on your, for your students. Let's see if that takes us there. It should, it's just taking a minute here. Just taking a minute, there it is. I do love the idea of using pictures and you can always make these bigger. Um, 
this it does have a paid site to it, but I've always just used the free site. And you create this title. Um, you come in here and you just type out the words that you would want, and then you click start, and it sticks them in this hexagon pattern. Um, and so it's just I like the idea of using the shape to make those connections, and definitely using you know like Sandra said, pictures would be great for how do you stick these things together. But then asking the kids to explain, well, why are you putting these two together? And how does this third item fit in there? Again, that's them using evidence, making an argument, backing it up. That's ELA standards and that social study standards right there. And it's doing all sorts of kinds of manipulatives. You could add in maybe some math and some counting and stuff with that. So there are a lot of options that you can do uh, with this, but I just, we wanted to show that to you. Yeah, and I think I saw in the one picture too, it looked like the teacher maybe just had blank hexagons and the students mm -hmm. were putting words in there. So maybe for our second grade students, that could really uh, be a possibility. So this was really cool. I'm so glad she showed me this one because I hadn't seen this before. Um, so now let's look at another one. And some of you might be familiar with this one. And this one is super cool. And we've got our histories, mysteries. So I really want to take a look at this one. This this website or this source allows students to be history detectives and it allows them to engage in primary sources based on this historical inquiry and the students are going to become detectives they're going to be answering these questions and they're going to look closely at images they're going to be able to ask questions about images they're going to collect evidence from the images and they're going to be able to start to formulate claims and all of these lessons they're broken up into units which we'll see in a second and they have lessons where the teacher just has to basically click and play the slideshow and it will take you through the lesson for for the students of course preview it make sure that it's good for your students um, and go from there the really other cool thing that they do is they get different perspectives on things that we might not necessarily teach um, in, a, in, a, in our curriculum, which uh, is, is really interesting. So you, when you go through these, you're gonna see that they're gonna give, for example, they'll, they'll, they'll touch on George Washington. And even in their introduction video, they'll tell you, we know George Washington was a leader and we know he has great aspects of, um, of his leadership. And they'll ask, you know, are all leaders good leaders? Then they might show a, a different perspective and they might show um, the perspective of from a slave that George Washington had owned at that time period. And they're gonna go through that story. So they do give a lot of different perspective that we might not hit or touch on in our curriculum. So preview them and see which ones that you think that your students could really benefit from. But these are so cool. I wanna take a look at the first grade ones and you'll see they're broken up into two different units here. The first unit is how do communities make good decisions? And you'll see that they have the different mysteries there. What does it mean to belong to a group? What does it mean to be a citizen? How do groups make decisions? So great job there. And then unit two, we've got what makes a good leader? And that kind of goes into uh, what I was just explaining. And it'll give you different perspectives of what a leader is. There's good and there's there's bad with leaders. And it lets the kids be able to answer some of those questions. Um, and it has really good video uh, introductions too. So when you go to this website, and I know Linda will have this linked for you, you'll be able to watch the little, it's like a five minute introduction. You'll be able to get more comfortable with them as a teacher. And then you'll be able to walk, easily walk through them with the students. It's a really cool website. So this is another great one that starts with inquiry, which is so cool. And she's showing you there. So, and a lot of them do say that these are pilot ones. I've noticed that when I was playing with a lot of them that they're putting out a lot of new ones and they're pilots and you can feel free to use it, feel free to give feedback so they can continue to make these um, excellent. So look at this one, where's the history in a name? And then it will go into, you have a slideshow presentation, you have a PDF, uh, all kind of teacher resources. So just a great one for inquiry as well. Yeah, that's one thing. Uh, this too was a grant from um, the federal government and for, uh, and I believe it, it is kind of a, a side partnership with the Library of Congress, but they are constantly putting new ones out. And so it's always something to kind of keep checking out or you can get on their um, email list and they'll update you and say, oh, hey, we, you know, we've got new ones out. And so it's kind of nice that they've got your like books that are mentioned. So if you want to add them to your library, or if your librarian is like, hey, I have my funds, what books does your level want to suggest that we buy? 
these are great things that you can find different stuff like that too. All right, now I wanted to show you probably one of, I think our best homemade uh, resources here is especially for K-6 is the Arizona Geographic Alliance. And if you are not familiar with it, I'm gonna take you through just a couple of lessons here and again, show you everything that, they, that they've got. So this is one called a walk around the school. And so this is a great, uh, great lesson where we start out um, and what it has is we start with the lesson where you've got vocabulary, and it's nice that you, all this stuff here with a lot of these books, one thing that was wonderful that came out of the um, pandemic is a lot of teachers read books and put them online on YouTube. And so in this case, you can come out here and I will link to it. It may be uh, a little slow as the afternoon goes on, the internet seems to get slower and slower. Let's see, let's take a minute. We're just gonna show you this. So hopefully you'll be able to see it. It might actually come up with the ad first. Oh no, there we go. And now- Can you guys hear that? Mom. Okay, Maria, <laughs> okay. Rosie the hen went for a walk. Across the yard. Around the pond. Okay, I'll stop it there because you guys can get the idea. But this is a great lesson that students can learn, like some of those geographic terms, location. Um, you could have them reenact different terms. They learn uh, the purpose of maps you'll see that they are referencing places like outside of their classroom. You can have kids, um, you know, walk around the campus and essentially take a walk, just like Rosie's walk. You know, this is a great one to do with kindergartners, like on what some of the first day of school to kind of acclimate them to the different places around the school. Um, and then you explain how maps work and how maps help people get from place to place. And then you have the students create a map of Rosie's Rosie's walk. And so once they've read the book or listened to the story, um, they can create this on the whiteboard. They could label different places on it. You could get butcher paper. There are any number of ways in which you could have them uh, cre recreate the map of Rosie's walk. Take them on a walk around the school using vocabulary from the book. So the across the yard, around the back, or through this. So they're learning some of those great, you know, vocabulary words that they need to do. Then they come back into the classroom and as a whole class, you could have the students sequence the walk. So now here we're doing some chronological stuff, right? What came first, what came second? They can illustrate it. They can make those patterns and connections um, to the story. And then you can have kids write um, a story themselves about the places that they walked in the school. And you could put all of that together for a completed book. So some of the vocab with this is things like around, through, under, over, and past. And these are great vocabulary terms for kinders to you know, learn as they're going, going through. But the nice thing about this is when you click on this link and it is hyperlinked for you. So it should take you out to, let me see here, the Geographic um, Alliance webpage. So here's the, here is this lesson for you. So they've got the teacher instructions that I just kind of went through quickly. They've got your student, they've got a checklist, they've got a student example that you can even see what some other students have created, vocabulary flashcards if you wanted to create that. 
It's got the national geography standards. And the nice thing is that they have, the Geographic Alliance has taken all of their lessons and tied them to Arizona's new standards. And so that's what's wonderful about these is that they're all grade level aligned. So when you search on say, geo history lessons here, since we're out here, you can filter by grade band, come to grade one, fly, and here you go, here are all the first grade lessons, which are tied to Arizona's standards. They're not tied to the national ones. I love it too, again, right? We're working smarter, not harder. Let's bring in some science, right? And let's do some science and some ELA and some social studies. You're doing four different content areas with one lesson, again, removing that block, like Maria said, but the kids are getting all this great background knowledge. So if you look geo STEM, let's just go first grade again. And here you've got all these great lessons here about you know maps and geography, some economics kinds of things, um, social studies, and a lot of them do writing that you tie into to ELA. So the Geographic Alliance is a great, great resource that all of these authors over here are, most of them are teachers that have won contests and submitted lessons. So that's one around the walk around the school. I wanted to show you another one, bringing in what Maria had said earlier about some diverse perspectives. And so this is about Cesar Chavez, American Hero. And again, if you click on this link, um, you can take it out there and it goes straight to, to the website. And so again, here we've got our book that we're reading and all of these books are online. So if you don't have them, you can watch them on YouTube, which is nice. But again, you're hitting ELA, you're hitting social studies, you could bring in some, you know, science and math and whatever. So we've got our vocabulary here of March boycott, migrant worker, civil rights and technology. And so in this case, we're going to start with technology and you distribute a brown bag with items of technology and discuss how the technology makes life easier. So maybe in the brown paper bag, you have a pencil. And so the kids have to talk about, okay, well, what about a pencil that makes life easier? Maybe you have a calculator. Maybe you have a phone. Maybe you have all different kinds of technology that fits in just a brown paper lunch bag, right? And the kids have to distribute those bags and then talk about technology and what is the importance of technology and how that relates to um, making their lives easier. So there are a lot of science ties in, in with this. Then after you do that, then you display images of workers and you do an observe reflect question um, and have students recreate this, the photos. So in this case, again, these are all um, items that you can go out and find and then review the definition of technology. What is technology? How does that make that work? And you can pass out, in this case, it's a California map because even though Cesar Chavez is from Arizona, he did a lot of his work in Arizona. Um, and so, and then you also read the story, Harvesting Hope. And so here it's got a link to a map. I will say the Arizona Geographic Alliance has amazing, beautiful maps. Okay, just go ahead. I trust the Geographic Alliance. And I will say, I have actually contacted them personally and said, hey, I'm looking for this kind of map and I don't see that you have one like it. And I'm like, oh yeah, we can make that for you you know, within reason kind of thing. So this is this great map for second graders to follow him through. You've got your tie here to Arizona where he's from in Yuma, but that's what the map looks like. So you've got the pieces of the map here um, that you can go over. And again, this is a link to the story being read um, out on, oh, this one is gonna show me an ad, sorry. That look. Actually, I'm just gonna pause it so you don't have to listen to the ad. But you can see, you can go out here and it reads through the story. It is a beautiful story all about family um, and whatnot. And then you have students add images to the murals of their maps as you read, um, read the story. So in this case, um, I also just wanted to show you some pictures and then I'll kind of come back to it. But for example, these are the images when it says, you know, display images of workers real easy to go out to um, the Library of Congress. It also links you to them, but have kids ask, okay, what are, again, observe, reflect, question. What do you see? You know, what's going on in this picture? What questions do you have about this person as he's working in the field? Um, let me show you some of the other, this is another one, which again, what is she doing? 
look at the tool, the technology, right, that she's using here as she's digging in the field, prepping it. And then here's another picture from um, one of his marches. For, and this is the actual one of the hose. So if you look back at the picture, the idea was is people were using these small hand hose bent over. I can't even imagine the pain your back would be in after having done that all day. And that's one of the things that Cesar Chavez fought for, right? Was better working conditions for, for people. And so these items, that's an image of him holding that actual short handled hoe. Um, and so it's great. And then again, because I find, you know, for a lot of the wonderful thing about being an elementary teacher is, you know, a little bit about a lot of different stuff, right? You are asked to know so many different things and there's no way everybody can know everything. And it's hard. And that can be sometimes intimidating that it's like, well, gosh, I don't know the background history for this. How am I supposed to teach it? Take the time to search and look. I found this here. And again, you'll include this in here. This is just a 16 minute of PBS video. It's not for kids, but it is a wonderful video that tells you the background of Cesar Chavez, what he did, what he fought for. And in 16 minutes, you can feel yourself, you know, much more, you know, more educated, more um, informed about who he was, what he did, what the farmer strike was. Tie it, you know, like when I started teaching, I started teaching way out in Gilbert where there was very, very few, um, you know, there were very few stoplights when I was teaching in Gilbert, right? And so it was all farming community around me. So I would have loved this lesson to kind of tie it into my kids and say, hey, what do the farms around us look like? If you happen to maybe live in a more rural area or historically, if, you know, most of Arizona started off with agriculture, you know, what did it used to look like? And there are all sorts of great resources that you can find it, but don't, um, my plea is don't forget to educate yourselves too. If it's something that you don't know a lot about Cesar Chavez, you've heard of him. Um, there are great things out there like this, just quick 16 minute video that will really help you feel um, informed and more comfortable about, uh, about going to it. And then the last thing I wanted to show you here was they have created these geography activity books. And they have done this for every grade level where you can um, go out here and let me just show you what they are on their website real quick. So these are the geography grade books. You can print these off, you can order them from them. Um, but let's say here, let's go to the first grade one. Um, again, this is all free, so it's, you know, totally free to you, but here it's got a map of the Phoenix Zoo, you've got some other maps here, different things, and it's different activities that you can do with your students on, um, for uh, geography kind of stuff. So as you're looking at, like, okay, where are we covering, hey, we've done a lot of history, we've done a lot of civics, but maybe we need to add some more geography in, this is a great place to, to do it. And like it here, here's Cesar Chavez Park even, right? Because he's got that tie to Arizona. So that is what I wanted to show you from the geography. Again, these are all hyperlinked. So when you get the PDF, you will have access to all of these um, when we send out the email in a couple of days. And now I'm going to turn it over to Maria. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, I think you have one more to show us, Linda. You're going to show us the e econ ed link, I think, before I start. That's right. Yes. So economics, like I said before, I never took economics and I ended up having to teach it for five years in high school. So it was very much a learning process for myself. There is uh, this website called econ ed link. And what's great about it is like the C3, they have taken student centered inquiry based hands-on lessons, put them outside here on the webpage, and they've done them by grade level. So um, let's see, I think this is what, just to show you how you um, can get out there, what it looks like here. So when you come out here, they've got all different kinds of resources. They've got resources for teachers as well, again, to kind of educate yourself and learn maybe a little bit more. But you can come over here and you can click lesson in this filter by, right? Oh, go away. And you can click apply and then it will bring you to um, just lessons. 
And so this is great that it's got all these different buttons here, like Bad Kitty gets goods and services. And so you can click the lesson here and it gives you the, the national standards, but it gives you all of the idea of how to do the warm up, the goods and services. It even prompts you with questions that you can answer for it, um, different ways to model it, um, a group activity. You can see here are links to make the copies of things. So it gives you all of this information. Here is a question, um, you know, again, more stuff. It even gives you like a little um, uh, prompts and even extension activities too. So these are a great way, the Econ Ed link when you come out here, um, have got some already kind of pre-made lessons for you. Like here, little red hen is a producer and consumer. So that would be a great one to go over after Rosie's walk. Hey, let's get some economics in and talk about producers and consumers. Cause those are economic items that kinder, you know, kinders can understand. Okay, I am making something or I am consuming something, they, they can understand those economic processes. And that's the economics that at a K2 grade band level, that's the kind of economics that you're, you're going over. You're not gonna be con talking about marginalization and you know, cost benefit analysis and like all that kind of stuff, but needs versus wants, can saving and spending, those basic fundamentals of, of economics are all the ones that are covered in these lessons. And this is a great place where you can just kind of search through here find it, a lot of them have books that are tied to it. So again, going out to our crosswalk and seeing, oh, okay, here's the ELA, the social studies standard, the economic standards that we're doing, we're doing these kinds of inquiries. This is the ELA standard I'm covering, boom, you know, more standards covered. So all different kinds of neat, neat lessons here. You can see, I mean, there's, there are tons of them. So lots to uh, go through. All right, now back to Maria. Awesome, thank you so much. I know that one was so important, especially because that's kind of new to all of us in the K2 world to be able to do economics. So thank you for that one. Well, I think we have learned about so many great resources that you can use to link ELA with social studies in the past maybe 30 minutes or so. So let's try now in this last section to figure out how we're going to do this and how we're going to start. So first we'll start by with on the next slide, why is ELA and social studies integration, and why has it been difficult for us in the past? We kind of talked about that a little bit. Um, we know that we had to teach a reading block and there were other um, barriers. Maybe the old standards didn't really connect as well to the new standards uh, or didn't connect as well to ELA standards, but now we know that our new standards, there are so many links that it makes that integration um, easy for us. So if you want to click on the first one, um, Linda, we're just going to kind of move through these. And with this one, you're going to see that when students are decoding, once they start to decode, they're going to have better comprehension when we start increasing that background knowledge. So we know that's a great way to start getting social studies into reading. On the next one, we can see that if you want to click there, quality responses are really going to come again from building that background information for students. So if they know more about what a story is about, their writing is going to improve. So we know that that's a benefit. Okay, let's keep going with our next one. So look at that little picture there. We're going to have increased efficiency. So by combining these two, we're going to be able to get you know, we say kill two birds of one stone, but we're going to be able to really make our classrooms efficient. We're going to be able to allow them to go into greater depths in both of these areas instead of having them in isolation. And then we're going to continue on with writing. Our writing will improve with quality responses as their background knowledge expands. And lastly, we're going to excite these students and we're going to get them interested. We know that social studies is, is engaging. It really allows them to be able to start to think critically and understand the world around them and how they fit into the world around them and what their part is as citizens. So this is all gonna tie together. So let's take a look at how do we fit social studies into our already packed classrooms where we emphasize high stakes te testing. Well, we're gonna take a look at planning time and we're also gonna look at providing um, ways that we can integrate social studies and make them connected. So let's start with our three strategies here. So we'll go into depth on all three of these strategies, but first let's just take a look at all three together. First, you're going to review your current reading series, curriculum for social studies, and start to make connections and see where the gaps are. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna use social studies read alouds throughout your school day, and we're gonna talk to you about trade books. 
And the third one we're going to do is use social studies text and curriculum as part of our literacy block we're going to integrate. So these are our three strategies. Let's take a look more in depth at strategy number one. So a lot of us might use Journeys or Wonders or Amplify or different programs in order to use um, our curriculum in social studies. Strategy number one for your planning time is going to be review your current reading series curriculum for your social studies connection. So this consists of examining the text that your series offers. There might be wonderful stories that you have in these series that you can start to pull out. The second one is choose them. Choose what works with social studies content standards, storylines, your themes, and your standards. And the last one, don't let the organization of the reading series determine your time needed or your order. So for example, as you're planning and you're going through and you're starting to think, this goes great with this standard. I can really use this story to teach the standard. And then I can go to the Library of Congress and I can get some primary sources. You don't have to start with chapter one and move through chapter 20. You can start with chapter 15 if that connects to what you're doing. So this is gonna be your first strategy to use in planning your integration. Okay, let's look at strategy number two. Oh, this actually connects with strategy number one. You're going to first, after you find which ones connect, then you're going to start adding read alouds that coordinate with your text and provide additional information to increase that knowledge. So you're gonna to start to fill your gaps. So what doesn't your series have? I know in Mesa we use Hardcourt and we've used Hardcourt for the past 20 years. We're gonna finally start moving into something, uh, might still be Hardcourt, we don't know, but just we're gonna start to upgrade and, and update. But in our Hardcourt series, we had plenty of text that we could use to integrate with social studies, but we had to really find them. We couldn't just start at the first one and move on. And then what the next thing was, is just like this slide is saying, we had to start looking for gaps. What doesn't it have? It didn't have a lot of nonfiction text. So then we had to go out, we had to find them. So let's look at determine. The next thing we're gonna do after we find those texts is determine what types of quest questions should work in tandem with the text to get at that essential understanding of the standards. So when I think of this part, I think of being intentional. I really need to spend some time planning my questions and planning the questioning strategies and planning the ways that I want students to be able to engage in that inquiry. And we showed you lots of great resources to be able to start doing that as well. And then the last one is provide opportunities, opportunities to discuss and write about what they're learning and address the questions that they still have. So this is a great way to be able to get the students to, um, Linda said in those C3 ones, to lead them to action. They're gonna start engaging with that and making connections with what they've learned in their um, content and the curriculum that you've just taught them. Okay, so that's strategy number one. Let's go to this one where it's creating a visual. So I might wanna have like a checklist of, hmm, here's my core series. Here's what it does have and here's what it doesn't have. It touches on civics, it touches on geography, it touches on history, but it doesn't get into anything about economics or financial literacy at all, which will probably be the most common thing that you will find. And so there's gonna be those that econ ed link that Linda showed you, as well as some other ones that you're gonna be able to go to to supplement that for yourself. So creating this visual can really help. So on strategy number two, this is where we get into what we call trade books or read alouds. And this is going to really help to link and engage your students. We know that students are engaged in stories. And so finding these trade books that you can use with your students, and they're also called, I believe we call them notable books as well. These are going to provide foundational skills for literacy development. They're going to provide children with a demonstration of fluent reading. So by reading these out loud, you're also going to be able to find these um, online. Linda showed you some of the read alouds. There's great ones. I would always say preview them from start to finish and just make sure nothing pops up in the middle or does anything wonky because we've had that uh, before as well. But those read alouds online are going to be great. These read alouds also are going to build background knowledge for your students, and they're going to be that engagement or that hook into your social studies lessons. So they're really great. Let's take a look at some of those notable books. And this one is from, I believe the CDC, the Children's Book Council in association with the NCSS, the Nas National Council for Social Studies. And they're gonna have these lists of trade books. And Liz is gonna show you that, that you're gonna be able to use when you know what standard or what theme or what um, content you want, you're going to be able to go here and they will give you a list of different books that will connect. So you can see there's your kindergarten through second grade list and you'll see the books there. 
that they've already done that compiling for you. So that is a great way to use trade books with your students. Okay, and then we got strategy three. We're going to integrate, integrate, integrate. We're gonna use social studies text as part of our literacy block. We're gonna pull in those primary sources that we showed you from Library of Congress. We're gonna use those secondary sources, some of those uh, fiction books that we showed you. Um, we're going to use informational text. And we didn't show you, but hopefully you're all familiar with those ones at the bottom there, the ReadWorks, Newzella and A to Z reading, those are also fantastic places where you can get news articles and you can get nonfiction information where you can bring those in and be able to have them. The great thing about those two is that I think it's ReadWorks, I'm pretty sure, is where they will actually level it for you. So if you have a, um, an article or um, some information that you want your students to read, they'll actually level it by like three levels. So you can have the same, um, the students all reading the same story, but at different levels. So these are another great resource for you. And someone said, yes, I think it was that, that one. Awesome, so this is gonna be your third strategy. We want you to make sure that you're integrating and for the next two slides, here's some really cool ways to do that integrating. You can have students become news anchors, which is so fun. They can report on current issues, classroom news, uh, write about current events, have discussions. You can build an awesome library, um, either online, virtual, or in person. And you can gather these primary and secondary sources that we have linked here. Um, and she has another one that's linked at the bottom that I don't think those there, we quite went over too much, but Docs Teach is another one down there that is a great link. Um, also, you can do interviews, which is another great way to connect with certain standards about asking and answering questions. And also, that's also a great one talking about perspective. If I really want to understand what it was like for someone, asking them what it was like is one of the best ways to do that. Okay, so that's great ways. Let's show you some more here on the next slide. You can use classroom timelines. I love those pictures. You can integrate social studies and ELA using role play. There's so many cool things where you can do like the wax museums or where the students come to life as a character. Those are really fun to do. Um, think outside of the box. You can use unique writing prompts. And there's some things there at the bottom. Um, DDQ is no. really good for that as well. We and, don't. And, oh, sorry, I think I hear some. Okay, sorry, I just wanted to make sure it wasn't a question. And then also you can create word walls or bulletin boards, visual displays, maybe display some of those hexagons that we showed you. So these are all great ways to link to ELA. Okay, so um, we're gonna admit that. I think somebody got bumped out there. One second. Okay, Linda, so we're gonna take it back to you to wrap us up. Right. All right, so we do have a more upcoming development. This is a QR code that links you to a, it's basically, it's like a bit.ly or a wakelet, which I am constantly updating with new PD. Um, and so for example, another great local resource that we have um, as far as economics goes is the Arizona Council on Economic Education. And they routinely have like elementary boot camps. They have um, teaching children's literature in using economics. Um, so there, there's a great place to do, and it's constantly getting updated. So it's a great thing to bookmark it. Um, if you don't have your phones handy, um, you will get this. And so you can go out there and, and look later. We do have some more seminars. If you got a lot out of today, please let people know. Um, I think I gave you guys the flyer. So we have um, essentially a month of seminars like this where we're going through looking at the standards. How do we use that? And really with that emphasis of tying um, ELA and social studies, making things smarter, not, uh, not harder for, for teachers in that way. I did want to take a minute to show you our um, ADE website. Um, and again, let me just double click so we can go out there and show you guys what is um, out there. So first, uh, like this was the state by grade band, the standards, the grade levels at a glance where you can click on these and click on them. Um, we also, here is where the ELA social studies and ELP crosswalk is. So you've got each one of these that you can, can click on. A couple things I wanted to show you that there is a link out here for resources. So if you come out here and say click first grade, this is another place where you've got here are your course considerations, the content that we want you guys to teach. But then here are links to all of these different kinds of resources that you can look out here 
um, that tie to our standards. Um, we also have uh, professional development videos that if you want more in depth, um, say here about recorded, these are little 10 minute videos here, but the recorded webinars, if say if you really want to go into inquiry and into questioning more, we've got some recorded webinars here that you can um, use, or if you want to look at some open education resource webinar, these are all past resources. Um, this is another one here using, um, this is more admin, but it works really well, like increasing reading scores using literacy rich lessons. And then the last thing I wanted to show you on here is our newsletter. So you can sign up here, or if you want, you can type your email into the chat. But I do a newsletter every month, and it is K-12. It has all of the different PDs that we have available, both that we're doing here through ADE, but we also have like here some that are going, here's a middle school um, boot camp. I think they had an elementary one. Um, oh, here, implementing classroom e economy K-5. So that was back in May. So they do have them periodically. So it's a great place to do it. I also do different other institutes, different, you know, like student art, uh, teacher grants, um, different just little things. So definitely if you're interested in signing up for our newsletter, you can type your name in the chat, but there are also the archived ones that you can go through and look at. And we've got those all here. And I think with that, um, that is it. So I wanted to say thank you both very much. Um, if you can type your first and last name into the chat for me to double check attendance, give me a couple of days to do the attendance. And at that point in time, you will get an email from me that says, great, your attendance has been recorded. You will also get a PDF version of this presentation that has all of the links, all of the resources that Maria and I have gone over. Um, and my Tammy's email is there, who is my supervisor, as well as my email. And please feel free to email me if you're struggling finding a resource. Um, I can also come out and do trainings specifically for schools. Um, we do all that virtually or in person, just kind of depends. I don't think, I think we'll be in person in the fall. Um, but um, we're there for you. And thank you so, so much for attending. Maria, any last thoughts and words? No, I want to tell them, make sure you get your newsletter though. That is an amazing source. I use it and I love it. And I get information to my teachers that way. So make sure you guys get um, the newsletter and thank you so much. You were wonderful participants today and really enjoyed working with you all. So thank you yes. very much. Thank you. You will be prompted to fill out a survey and we'd love any comment in the open, you know, the open comments about what went well, what you'd like more of anything like that would be, would be great. So thank you all so much for coming. Enjoy the rest of your summer. Stay safe. And I'm going to end the recording now.